God from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same here. Yeah. Your history can prove that there's nothing you can't do. How are you guys doing today? Whenever I come back, we always start off weak. We're really going to do this today? Let's try again. Good morning, Fifth Street. How are you guys doing today? Good morning. Good morning. That was improvement. It was improvement. Ms. Darlene, you know, homeschool mom, we, we give you those incrementals, but we're going we're gonna to do this right because we're here for the Lord, aren't we? Yes. Are we awake? Is yeah. this thing on? <laughs> Good morning, Fifth Street. How are you guys doing today? Good morning. Amen. We are here to praise the Lord. We are so happy to have you guys here. Um, we are a, uh, a family-friendly worship service. So if you've got little ones, don't take them anywhere. We love to hear them. Even if they want to get chatty, even if they got to throw three few tears, the Lord loves them being a part of our service. So we're so thankful that they're here. Um, with that, if for whatever reason you do need to take your children, uh, we have a nursery service from nine weeks to four months old. Or we have a hospitality room right outside the doors to your right. Um, that are, as long as you're escorting them, you're welcome to take them in there as well. But if not, keep them here in service. We love to hear them. Pastor will preach, and he gets encouraged by tears and shouts and all kinds of other things. He loves having children in church, because that's a reminder of what? Our church is alive, 
We've got generations to come, and it doesn't end with us. Amen? Amen. If you are new here, um, I promise I'll only be here for the month, and then I'll rotate out, and you'll get a new, whole new deacon. But while I'm here, if you'll fill out a Connect card and give it to one of the ushers, we have a small gift for you. But we want to make sure that we have a record of your visit. We want to have ways that we can connect with you, whether it's praying for you, whether it's fellowshipping with you. Whatever that may be, just make sure you fill out that Connect card and give it uh, over. Uh, with that, I have uh, one more announcement before Ms. Darlene comes up. Um, YAC is happening. Youth After Church is happening today. So if you have any questions, you can see Mr. Jeffrey or who's your... Leah? Is Leah here? To, no. Who's... Ms. Brittany is, is Mr. Jeffrey's backup. So if you have any questions about what Youth After Church is today, speak to one or two of them and they'll get you set up. And now it's time for Ms. Darlene to come up. All right, so I am here to talk to you guys about Vacation Bible School, which is our best, well, I guess I can't say best, but it's a really great event that we do every year. It is our biggest, our biggest um, evangelical opportunity for our community. So we are super excited. Our dates are May 29th through June 2nd. Um, the first two nights, three nights, Three nights are at night, and then Saturday and Sunday, we do those days on in the morning. So we try to be very flexible for those of you that have jobs, um, and so that everybody can participate. Now, here's what I need. Today, if you are a member of our church living a biblical lifestyle, we need you to volunteer to lead with us. It's as simple as being a line leader and helping kids get from one station to the other, or being a security or doing crafts or recreation, we have very easy jobs. If you're like, let me teach the kids, I've got a job for you too. So come and see me and Rochelle in the foyer today. We have about two weeks that we need to get all of our slots filled so that we can open registration. We can't re open registration if we don't have volunteers. So join me in the back after church so I can sign you up. And even if you don't know where you want to serve yet, just let me know and we'll let the cards settle and then we'll let you know how you can serve us. All right, that's it. Thank you, Ms. Starling. Um, Ms. Alice? Well, Miss Prophet, I can see you've made it back now, and I apologize for having been out for about eight days with eye surgery, but you know I like to see the new members before they're brought out. We haven't had a chance to interview anyone so far. Who do we have here now? I understand there's new students in, uh, let's see, classical, uh, early Christian studies, and also ancient studies there. Uh, who are you bringing in? Where are these people from? Well, at FSU, we have all these new students. Our latest arrival is... A young lady from Salem. Salem? Yes, Salem. And um, we have lots of new people that have just been coming and joining and taking classes at FSU. So um, they'll be heading your way, sir. Well, how am I going to be? When am I going to be then? Where? Well, you don't even know. We have a talent show showcased for you. You can come on Tuesday night, this Tuesday, April, April 9th, and we are meeting at 6.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And we will have all these new students with all this talent showcased so that you can observe them. So, this Tuesday, 6.30, I can meet them, yes? Yes. And so can all of you. So join us that night. Come out and enjoy us at Fifth Street Baptist Church for a little bit of mystery. And talent. Yeah. Amen. All right. Thank you. One last announcement. I um, don't have as loud of a voice, Mr. F Mr. Frank, so I'll get right on top of this mic. Do y'all guys remember when we did the Lottie Moon offering? Yes. Who had Lottie come visit them? Do y'all remember the budget that we set for Lottie Moon? Do you remember that we busted the budget we set for Lottie Moon? Yes. So I was talking to Annie Armstrong and she's very jealous because she looked at the offering that we've made so far and we're not anywhere near our budget. So I'm gonna ask you guys to make sure we don't let Annie down like we didn't let Lottie down and make sure that in the, in the pews we have Annie Armstrong offerings. Those support our North American missions. If you can give whatever it is, let's make sure that we get Annie feeling just as much love as we did Lottie, amen? amen. With that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Mr. Austin and we'll get going back with praise.
Yes, I believe we have an Annie Armstrong video. For almost a hundred years, in big cities with a hundred skyscrapers and tiny towns with one stoplight, on college campuses and Native American reservations, in churches too many to count, hundreds of thousands of men and women and boys and girls have made hundreds of thousands of life-changing decisions. Almost none of them knew her name. And yet, she was there. Annie Armstrong lived more than a hundred years ago. Only this one picture of her survives. History could have easily forgotten her. But Annie Armstrong is worth remembering. In the late 1800s, when most women had no voice, Annie was one of the first to speak up. First, for the urban poor in her hometown of Baltimore, and then for Southern Baptist missionaries around the world who desperately needed support. It was for these people that she helped start the National Women's Missionary League. As its first executive leader, she gave women a platform in their local church and in ways that they'd never done before. These women helped focus Southern Baptist attention on the hurting and the lost and the missionaries trying to reach them. Annie wrote letters, 18,000 in just one year, and she traveled across America, encouraging missionaries and inspiring churches to pray, to give, and to act. She worked long hours, paid her own expenses, and refused to accept a salary. And in the darkest days of the Depression, right before she died, an offering was named after her. Today, the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering helps missionaries in the U.S. and Canada start new churches and meet needs through Compassion Ministries. Over the years, Southern Baptists have given more than $1 billion to that offering, and 100% of it, every penny, has gone straight to the mission field. There's still work left to do. The need is bigger than ever, and that's why even though she lived more than a century ago, and even though only one picture of her survived, Annie Armstrong's influence lives on. Because today in North America, just as it's been from the beginning, anywhere a missionary is sent, every time a new church is born, anytime someone gives to her offering so that a lost person might be found, Annie is there. is moving in our midst and we have so many things blessing us and so many ways to offer our blessing let us continue our service with worship we stand and sing egypt
out the sea. You have led me through the deep. Hallelujah. shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, shall men give unto you, into your bosom. Father God, we ask right now that you would just help us to understand that it's not about us and it's all about you. 
We ask that you would bless this offering right now, God, that it will go forth and do your work and your will, not just in this church, but not just in this community, but throughout the world. We ask that you would just bless it, multiply it, and let it do many, many great things in your name. We thank you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Thank you. 
about the rapture of the church and this tribulation period in detail on Sunday night. So if you'd like, you know, sort of the full picture of that seven-year period, you can go online and uh, you can uh, read or read or listen or watch my sermons from Sunday night on Revelations chapter 5, 6, and 7. Those are available on our website, on Facebook, and YouTube if you'd like to take a look at those. Jesus, at this point on this Wednesday, in the last week of his life, was prompted to prophesy about what the world will be like immediately before he returns when one of his disciples begins to admire the beautiful temple grounds. This temple was built by Herod, uh, who was a fairly cruel Roman leader, but desired to build something uh, to honor himself and to honor God, uh, to honor the Jewish God, um, Yahweh, the one true God. Um, and it took him over 50 years. In fact, when Jesus was walking on the earth at this time, the temple still wasn't completed in its fullness, but it was still beautiful. And as Jesus spent that Wednesday teaching, he and the disciples are now walking out of the temple and they're admiring its beauty. One disciple says, Teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. That in itself was not wrong. It was a beautiful, beautiful facility. But here's what's happening. As the disciples walk with Jesus out of the temple, they are by this time believing that Jesus is in fact the Messiah. But they misunderstood what Jesus would do and when he would do it. So Jesus spends this last week of life, first on Palm Sunday, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, and you remember that. I threw quite a fit up here to get us excited about Jesus riding in as the crowds yelled, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And they recognized in that moment that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah as he rode into Jerusalem on that donkey. And then Jesus spends the next couple days going in and out of Jerusalem, spending his nights in an adjacent village called Bethany. And so his disciples, they, they think that this is it. This is the restoration of the kingdom that all of the Old Testament prophets preached about, right? Jesus now has taken his seat in the temple, and he's preached and brought truth from God's word, and they're seeing him do miraculous deeds. So on this Wednesday, as they leave the temple grounds, his disciples believe that this is it. This is the restoration of God's kingdom that the Old Testament prophets told us about. Jesus is going to take his seat of authority. Israel is going to recapture all of our land, and God will not only rule in Israel, but he will rule all the earth, just like he promised. They believe that this is about to happen now, on this Wednesday. They believe that he was going to establish his earthly kingdom. And thus, this prompts Jesus to tell them about the timing of the end. And in Mark chapter 13, verse 4, his disciples say, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? So the first thing that Jesus is going to do with his disciples, now, by this point, they've reached the Mount of Olives. And they're looking down on the temple, and Jesus is about to prophesy about the end, or rather, the beginning of the end. And so in verses 1 through 13, which I'm just going to briefly um, review with you because I preached on this on Palm Sunday, he's going to talk about the beginning of the end. So, so some things that are going to happen that are sort of going to lead up to the end. And he's answering the disciples' questions. How will we know when the time will, will be right? First thing, verses 1 through 4, the temple will fall. Remember, they had just said, Jesus, look Look at this. 
Look at the stones. Look, look at this beautiful precipice. Look how beautiful it is. And Jesus tells them that it will fall. That's a big deal for the Jews. Right? They believe that Jesus is going to take his place of authority in that temple that's just been almost completely rebuilt. It's time for Jesus to take his place of authority here. It's time to restore the kingdom of God with our Messiah, Jesus, from Nazareth. And the first thing Jesus says to them is this. All these stones will fall. Not one stone will be left upon another. You see, the temple and the worship taking place in it produce no spiritual fruit. Therefore, like the fig tree that Jesus cursed in Mark chapter 11, the temple and its fruitless system of worship will fall, and it did fall. In A.D. 70, the temple fell when Rome Caesar ordered the destruction of Jerusalem after the Jews revolted, and not one stone was left upon another. That prophecy was fulfilled already in A.D. 70. Then Jesus, he moves in verse 5 of Mark 13 to talk about things that will happen leading up to his return. And the things which he's going to describe are going to happen, and then over time, they're going to increase in intensity. In verses 5 and 6, Jesus tells us that there will be many false Christs. Many will come claiming to be the Messiah. And, and right now, in, in our world, in our culture today, there's all kinds of false messiahs. There are all kinds of people, all kinds of movements in our culture that claim to be your and my salvation. Amen? Amen. And that's going to keep happening. It's going to keep happening more and more and more. Verses 7 and 8 tell us that there's going to be increasing wars and a constant threat of war on a global level. On top of that, increasing intensity in earthquakes, famines, and other natural disasters. Those are not only going to keep happening, they're going to get worse over time. Verse 9 tells us that there will be a persecution of Christians on a global level and to a degree unseen in all of history. We've seen, of course, persecution of Christians, and that, that goes up and down in intensity based on where you live. But what will happen is this will begin to happen on a global level and, and at, at an intensity level that we've never seen before. And then verse 10, Jesus says, this global persecution of Christians will be coupled with the sealing and sending of 144,000 Christian Jewish preachers. You can read about this in Revelation chapter 7. They will have the glorious effect of spreading the gospel message to all people everywhere. So you see, as what the enemy intends for evil, as persecution increases and Christians are martyred for their faith, that will simply be fuel for the fire of the gospel. And people will be, during that time, saved at numbers and to the degree that this world has never, ever seen in our history. Innumerable people, as, as John saw in Revelation chapter 7, from all around the world will be saved during this period of time. In verses 11 through 13, Jesus says, the things leading up to his return, we will see faithfully following Jesus will be unpopular. It's already unpopular. It will be countercultural. Family members will turn on one another, even to the point of having one another arrested and put to death. But have no fear, he says. Have no fear. Because the Holy Spirit will provide the guidance that we need in those last days. He will even provide the very words that you need to say in those moments where you need to say them. Many will be put to trial and or death for our faith in Jesus. And Jesus says, these are just the beginning of the end. We live in that period of time now. And the difficulties we face, like childbirth, will increase in intensity until a point in time when Jesus returns to rapture or take up all born-again believers to be with him in heaven. 
So we live in a season right now before the rapture of the church. When these things that Jesus describes in verses 1 through 13 will continue to happen, they will continue to increase in intensity until the point in time which God has determined when Jesus will return part way in the clouds and take us to be with him in heaven. And then all the believers, the whole church, will be taken up to be with Christ. And after that time, after that rapture, then... A period of seven years will begin. After the rapture of a church, the seven-year tribulation will begin. Next, Jesus describes, beginning in verse 14, and that's what I'm going to focus my time on this morning, he describes what will happen during that period of seven years. Now, if you're a born-again believer, you won't be here. But during that time, other people, after the church is gone, they'll be saved. And they'll have to walk through this. And it will be a very difficult, it will be a horrible, horrible time. So now Jesus is telling his disciples, first he told them about the events leading up to the rapture, which we see if you want to read about it in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Next he's going to say, the, the things leading up to the very end, so this is the last seven years before Jesus comes back. These are going to be the things that happen. Look at verse 14. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand. Now this is an interesting phrase. Abomination of desolation. This is not the first time that that phrase has been used. In fact, the prophet Daniel prophesied about this in Daniel chapter 9, 27, 11, 31, and 12, verse 1. It refers to the defilement of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Now this prophecy, first uttered by Daniel, was fulfilled in B.C. 168. The abomination of desolation took place first in B.C. 168 when Antiochus IV, a Syrian general, profaned the temple by erecting in the temple on the burnt offering altar a offering to Zeus and he spread all over the temple pig's blood and did all kinds of, of horrible things inside of the Jewish temple and so this was the first fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy of the abomination of desolation so the Jewish uh, the, the Jewish readers and Jesus' disciples when he said that they would have understood okay that took place already before Jesus came. Now Jesus is saying, there's going to be another one of those. So when you see that happen, then a bunch of things are going to happen after that. So take notice, and by the way, Mark made a note to us, this isn't for the disciples, this is to you and me. We are the reader. We are the ones waiting to see this fulfilled. He said, let the reader understand. The first thing that will happen is the abomination of desolation or the defilement of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Jesus says that will happen again during the seven-year tribulation period shortly before Jesus returns. It is at this time when the Antichrist, referred to by Paul in his letters as the man of lawlessness, he will actually assist the Jews in rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. He'll make a pact with the Jews. He's going to be their friend. He's going to help them rebuild the temple. He's going to do it in Jerusalem. Now this man of lawlessness, after he helps the Jews rebuild the temple, halfway through the seven-year covenant that he makes with them, he's going to break his covenant. Because Satan's a liar. And then what he's going to do is he's going to place himself on the throne in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And he's going to require all the world to worship him as God. Paul writes about this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. He says, let no one deceive you in any way. 
For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness, that's the Antichrist, is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So, when the Antichrist sets up his seat of power over the whole world in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, he will make war against the Jews and the Christians. All that time, Jerusalem will be the center of an unbelievable revival. Jews and Christians alike will flock to Jerusalem. This will be the heart and soul, the the center of the 144,000 preaching Christian Jews. The two witnesses who come will preach in Jerusalem. And so it makes sense that the enemy, Satan, will place his Antichrist in the center of the temple in Jerusalem where he will declare himself to be God. And at that time, when the Antichrist takes his position of authority in the temple, an intense, unbelievable, escalating persecution will take place in Jerusalem. Jesus continues, look, verse 14. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one who is on the housetop must not go down or go in to get anything out of his house. And the one who is in the field must not turn back to get his coat. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, but pray that it may not happen in the winter. The persecution that the Antichrist begins first in the city of Jerusalem will be so bad and it will happen so quickly and escalate so quickly that people will need to run for their lives. They won't even, if they're outside their house when the persecution begins, they won't even be able to go back to get a coat, a possession, money, water, food to survive. They will literally, wherever they are in that moment, have to run for their lives. And they will flee to the mountains, to barren wastelands where there will be nothing for them. No resources, no shelter. And that's why Jesus says, woe to the the woman who's pregnant or nursing. Woe to them who are not able to run, who need more nutrition and, 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 and food and water to take care of babies that are growing on the inside or babies that are taken care of on the outside. Woe to them. Woe if all of this takes place during the winter when it's cold and, and, and temperatures reach a dangerous level. So the Antichrist first will take his position of power in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Then he will immediately begin persecuting Jews and Christians alike at a level that we've never seen. It will be so bad when it begins and so intense that people who live in Jerusalem won't even be able to go back into their home to get a coat. He continues, verse 19, For those days will be a time of tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the creation, which God created until now and never will. Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved for the sake of the elect whom he chose. He shortened the days. Our world has experienced some pretty horrific events, haven't we? I mean, just think of... uh, the, 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 the flood during Noah's day. Think of Sodom and Gomorrah. On top of that, think of all of our wars. World War I, World War II, the Black Plague, genocidal dictators who have wiped out entire people groups. Most recently, COVID-19. Think, think of all those things. And now Jesus says, nothing that's occurred in the past, no natural disaster, no war, no disease, no famine, no persecution will we'll even, all those will pair in, pale in comparison to what will happen at this point in time. The events that will take place during that seven year tribulation, and especially during the second half, or the second three and a half years, which is called the Great Tribulation, will be far worse than anything humanity will ever experience. 
God has already established that time of tribulation, however. And, the, and Jesus says he did so for the sake of the elect. So before that tribulation begins, there will be a rapture of the church. All born-again believers will be taken up with Jesus to heaven. And after the church is taken up, there will still be people after that who become believers in Jesus. And they're going to have to walk through that time of tribulation. Many of them will be martyred. But some will remain. Jesus says, woe to those who, who are here during that time, but for their sake, for God's love for them, who identifies believers here as the elect, reminding us that God is still in control, that he shortened those days. If God did not intervene to shorten that seven year, or shorten that period to make it only seven years, I believe the enemy sent uh, Satan and his antichrists and demons surely would have uh, killed every single living being on this planet he continues in verse 21 but then if anyone says to you behold here is the Christ or behold he's over there do not believe him for false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray if possible the elect so Jesus sort of bounces back to us to us living today. He gave us the sign of what to look for with the Antichrist and the intense persecution as he takes his seat of power in Jerusalem. He says, therefore, if someone comes now and tells you, hey, look, there's the Christ, or hey, look over there, there he is, he says, don't believe him because many false Christs will arise. Between today and that day when that tribulation begins, there's going to be a lot of people who come and go proclaiming to be our Messiah. But look closely at verse 22. It will not be possible for them to betray or to deceive the elect. And so we as God's elect, God's people, who have the Holy Spirit residing in us, will know that that is not Jesus. They will, we will know that that false Messiah is not our Christ. Paul warns about this. Let me read it one more time in 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 through 4. He says, That you do not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed, either by a spirit or a message or a letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. If someone says, oh, Jesus has come back, there he is. Well, has the Antichrist taken his seat of a power in the center of the rebuilt throne uh, rebuilt temple in Jerusalem? No, that's not the Messiah. That's very simply what Paul is saying there. So don't let people stir you up. Don't let people get you excited about simple, silly things. Stay in the word of God. Many, many false Christs will come. Many saviors will enter into our lives and enter into our culture. Jesus told us about what will happen during the time before he returns. Those things, many of them, have not yet happened. The enemy Satan will continue to lure people into his trap to cause people to believe that they are the Messiah. If you go to Google and just type Messiahs or Saviors, there's a whole list of people living right now with followers who've made people believe that they are the false or that they are Christ, when in, in reality they are false Christ. What I want to tell you today, and what, what I believe Jesus was telling his disciples in giving them this information and giving it to us, what Paul was writing to the Thessalonians is this. Do not be deceived. Know this. First of all, no one knows the day or the hour of Jesus' return. No one. According to Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. We do know that specific things will happen before Jesus returns. Number one, all believers will be raptured up to him in heaven. The Antichrist will be revealed 
and he will take his place on a throne in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. The world will experience unprecedented war and disease and famine, natural disasters and cruelty on a global scale. And the world, listen to this, according to Revelation, look at verse, uh, chapters 5 through 7. The world will recognize those events as God's judgment. So as long as the world is denying God, the time is not yet. They will in that time, shortly before Jesus returns, hide themselves in rocks, the book of Revelation says, ask those rocks to fall on top of them, and they will recognize on a global level that God is judging this world. So, if anyone tries to tell you that they know when Jesus is coming back, you should run. That person is a liar and a false prophet, and he or she is being used by the enemy, Satan, because no one knows the day or the hour of Jesus' return. There are people today that are doing that. If anyone claims to be Jesus, who has returned... Apart from the perfect fulfillment of every Old Testament and New Testament prophecy given to us by the Lord and his prophets, run. Because that person is a liar and a false prophet and is being used by the enemy, Satan. Don't worry. As powerful as these satanic workers are in the eyes of the, of the world, God will protect us. And God will give us supernatural knowledge through his word and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He will enable us to stand and testify about the truth of Jesus Christ. We have nothing to fear. What is, at the end of the day, what is the, the worst thing that could happen to us? We die and we go to be with the Lord in heaven. That's right. That's the worst. And that's pretty good. Only God could take what would be viewed by the world as the worst and make it pretty awesome. In fact, the best. Therefore, let me conclude in verse 23. Jesus says, take heed. Jesus says, listen. I have told you everything in advance. We have, according to Jesus, everything we need to know about living in these last days. We have everything we need to know. Jesus says, pay attention. In applying that to our lives, first, don't be wrapped up in the things of this world. This world will end. We know it will. I've read, read the end of the book. Jesus tells us in detail how it will end. So don't get wrapped up in the things of this world. All that stuff's going to end. It's all going to be burned up. Focus on the things instead. Focus on the things of the Lord. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. James Edwards writes, The mark of faithfulness is watchfulness. Not foretelling the future, but obedience in the present. When Christ returns, he will fulfill the many Old Testament prophecies about the end. But second, despite imminent signs, believers cannot calculate when or where or how the end will come. When it comes, no one will miss it. Until it comes, no one should be misled. So how do we live in these last days? I want to I give you three ways briefly now how do we live. How do we live in these last days? Because you know what? The Lord told us how to live. Number one, walk closely with the Lord and obey him, not the world. As we live in this world, and as we continue to minister in this culture, it's going to get more and more difficult to live an obedient life, to follow the word, and to fulfill the mission. It's not going to get easier over time. We, by God's grace, live in America. We are in a season of blessedness from God here that will not last forever. 
It's going to get more difficult to tell people you're a believer. It's going to get more difficult and probably down the road illegal or even dangerous to tell people about who Jesus is. And while we walk in these last days, let us walk closely with the Lord, not with this world. Number two, stay on mission. The Great Commission. We're, we're to go out these doors, and we're to go, and we're, we're to tell the world about Christ. We're to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, remembering that he's not left us, and he'll never leave us or forsake us, but he'll be with us even to the end of the age. We are to live on mission for Christ. And then finally, we are to be ready at all times for his return. His return, meaning when he comes to take all believers home in the rapture of the church, is imminent. It could happen at any moment. It could happen right now. And oh, that would be a great day. Amen? Amen. Any y'all excited for Jesus to come back and take you home? <laughs> Amen. Because the trumpet will sound and the dead will rise first and then the living will be taken up with him. In that moment, we will be in the presence of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more persecution. There'll be no more death, no more disease, no more aching knees, no more hurting backs. There'll be no more worry about tomorrow. We will be in the presence of the Lord. Amen? Amen. What if he doesn't return in this moment, but what if he returns tomorrow? And what if today is your last day? If today is our last day, does that change the way we live? I think it does. And Jesus told us to live as if every day were the last day. And so third and last, as we wait in these Times as we wait the return of our Lord, we live as if this moment were my last moment. That really helps put everything in perspective, doesn't it? Things that seem really important don't seem quite as important if Jesus is coming back tomorrow. Is your family going to be with you in the air when that trumpet sounds? Your friends, your co workers, your neighbors? Oh, man, I can't wait for that day. And so I want to compel you today to live as if today were that day, the last one, because it could be. And how's God going to use you for his kingdom in these last days? We're going to have a time of invitation now. If you're unfamiliar with this, in a minute, we're all going to stand up and sing a song together. And this is our opportunity to respond to whatever it is that God has done in your heart um, in these few moments we've had to worship together today. Is he speaking to you through his Holy Spirit? Perhaps today is your day of salvation. Maybe you were wondering, when, when that trumpet calls and Jesus takes all believers to go to be with him in heaven, I don't know if I'll, I'll, I'll be a part of the call. Well, you can be. You come forward when we start singing. I want to I tell you about how you can follow Christ and know that you're saved. Or maybe you're a believer and it's time for you to come home. Maybe you wandered from the Lord and you now studied with us Mark 13 and you, you, you feel convicted by the Holy Spirit. Like, this is... These are the last days. This is it. I don't have a lot of time left. I need to make things right. You come forward. We'll pray with you. Or perhaps you just have a, a reason that you want to keep yourself to pray and the altar will be open. You come up here and pray. I'll be up here to pray with you if you would like me to do that. But don't let this moment pass. If God's spirit is moving, don't ignore that. Feed that fire that the Holy Spirit has created inside of you. And let's see what God would use you to do on these last days. Would you all stand with me? Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you, God, for giving us these signs, these reminders of what it will be like at the end. 
Help us to heed this warning. Help us to be at attention. Help us to be at the ready. Help us to be faithful in this time that you've given us. Help us to be watchful for your return and to use the time and the resources and and what we have wisely so that, Lord, so that when that trumpet calls or we die first, whichever one happens, we'll hear from you, our Lord, well done, good and faithful servant, as we enter that place you prepared for us. We love you, Lord God. You're a good God. You're a faithful God. We believe that the things that we read about today will happen. We believe that you will meet us where we are in this time of the last days, that you will not leave us alone, that you will give us the words to speak, that you will give us comfort through your spirit, that you will use this church as an army of gospel preachers, and that many, many, many people in the Keys have yet to be saved. Help us to be the ones that take them this message that changes lives and eternities. We love you, Lord, and we hand over this time to you as we respond in accordance with the conviction, the compelling of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You come as God leads. We'll be here. You come.
serve an awesome, awesome God. Amen? Amen? He's a good God, and he's worthy of our worship and worthy of our praise. So church, go from this place and proclaim the gospel message that changed your life so that others could hear and be saved. Come on back at 6 o'clock tonight. We're back in the book of Revelation. So if you're interested in what you heard today, that's what we talk about on Sunday nights right now as we move through that book in the Bible. Have a wonderful day. I pray God's blessing upon you and your family. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and for all you've given to us. Help us to go from this place and proclaim the gospel message and continue to change lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.